Thank you so much for that lovely introduction and those very warm, wonderful words. Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, all of you who are here today, I'm delighted to be in this really wonderful space which this morning I toured and felt the silence and the reverberation of something that is uh, very special right here in the heart of London on Cromwell Road. I could feel my blood running in my veins, it was so silent. And that's a very great privilege in the center of a great metropolis. I'm also very pleased to be here among the Ismaili uh, people of Great Britain and all their guests, because over the years that I was Governor General, I did weave a very warm and uh, great relationship with His Highness and uh, am deeply honored as a Canadian that he should have chosen uh, Canada as his center uh, for pluralism, that uh, with him I dug the first sod for the Imamate, which is on Sussex Drive, just down the road from Rideau Hall where the Governor General resides that in the spring of 2008, he then opened that center and I was able to be present there. And just on Saturday night, I left on, on Sunday to come here, I was at a conference at which Benoit Junot, who as many of you know, heads the Aga Khan's um, museum network, gave a talk on what's going to happen in Toronto on some wonderful acreage, which is in a very prominent place we will be having the Ismaili Centre uh, in Toronto. There's one other in Canada, as you know, in Burnaby, British Columbia. And this one uh, will be right in the heart of Toronto. And at the other end of the property will be the Museum of, of uh, the Isla Islamic Art of the Aga Khan. This is such an honor for us in Canada to think we have this relationship with uh, the Ismaili people through uh, their Imam and through a man who has done so much and is doing so much for development in the world and who gives us an example of what it is to give to the world, to help develop the world where there is a need. I first uh, met the, the Aga Khan when I was Governor General and uh, was able to talk him into giving a, uh, the closing speech of the Governor General's Leadership Conference in 2004. I wanted spiritual and practical people to open and close what is a very practical uh, seminar of 225 young leaders spending two weeks traveling in Canada learning about it. So it opened with Desmond Tutu and it closed with the Aga Khan. And we couldn't have had a more wonderful set of bookends, as I called them, uh, to do this. In the meantime, of course, I had seen um, a number of things. When I was Governor General, I was Commander in Chief of the Canadian Forces, and every year at Christmas time, I went to where our forces are, and first of all, went to Bosnia, went to um, uh, the Arabian Gulf, went to Kosovo, then turned to the Middle East, um, to our frigates in the Arabian Gulf, as I say, and then, and then to Kabul twice. And in Kabul, the first time, uh, I was taken to Babur's Gardens, which were ruined, uh, just war-torn, completely ruined. And the next year, I went back at Christmas time, and the terracing had been laid out again. The fruit trees, the almond trees, the cherry trees had already been planted, and things were coming into being again. A wonderful lesson to us all that basically when you create beauty and the integration of beauty and culture with development, you bring about not only a change in the landscape, but you bring about hope. And that is what I most admire about what His Highness has been doing in the world and which you, many of you, participate in. I would like to begin a bit with what we Canadians represent as a country, because I can speak basically about Canada, as I am a Canadian. We live in Canada in a huge, imagined land. 
because we can only know a limited number of people in our lives. You, even the Governor General who gets to travel the entire country, and I traveled 200,000 kilometers a year around the country and went to 80 or 90 communities, I probably figured it out that I only met maybe 40,000 people in six years. But in our private lives, we live a life much more restrained than that. So we can't, as individuals, know everybody. But it is important that what is important is that we imagine that other people are part of the same country. To a great extent, we can imagine what it would be like to live in Whitehorse or Yellowknife or Bonavista Bay. We aren't geniuses at imagination, so we can't describe the smell of the sea or the crunch of the ice exactly as it exists. But what we can do is to say that it is our imagination that allows us to feel that we are all part of the same country, to assume the existence of others who are, in turn, part of us, whom we will never know. Once we have closed down our imagination, nobody belongs to a country, not even us. The other reason why the imagination counts is that we are able to think of the other as somebody outside ourselves, and therefore, if we develop the right attitude, we will be able to say that it doesn't matter whether the other is an Inuit or a Croatian. Those origins lose their electric charge because the imagination should be great enough to comprehend all the people, even the ones we can't visualize as part of our country. I want to quote right at the start here, as this is in a series about environment, something that is different about Canada and somebody who is different because we are Canadian. Celia Watt Cloutier was a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007, and she is the former head of the Inuit Circumpolar Conference. She says, and I quote here, we remain today, and we're talking 2009, a hunting people of the land, ice, and snow. The process of hunting teaches our young people to be patient, courageous, bold under pressure, and reflective. They learn to be focused, strategic, and become natural conservationists. They learn to control their impulses to withstand and cope stressful situations, to develop sound judgment, and ultimately wisdom, which we call salaturnic. Without these skills, they couldn't survive for a day, much less thrive for the millennia, which we Inuit have done. Our hunting culture is not only relevant for survival on the land, it teaches crucial life skills and wisdom that are transferable to the modern world. Many Inuit who have acquired and continue to practice these traditional skills are in large part making it in the modern world. I have to tell you that some of our northern people have an airline. Uh, they took $35 million in settlement for some of the use of some of their land and have turned it into nearly a $200 million corporation with all kinds of small businesses funded. The airline is only the largest part of it. In fact, many Inuit who are connected to the values and traditions of our traditional culture are better equipped and able to balance more effectively the two worlds. Persistent organic pollutants including DDT and PCBs and other compounds released into the environment far to the south are carried north on the winds and ocean currents and they accumulate in the bodies of the animals we hunt and eat, like whale and seal. And I emphasize here that the Inuit still live on this food. In the 1980s, through strong collaborated research, they discovered, we discovered, and this is Scylla speaking, that toxins ingested through our traditional subsistence diet, which is caribou, seal, whale, um, were poisoning our bodies, including the nursing milk of our mothers, in concentrations much higher than people who live in the South. These per persistent organic pollutants impact us far more than any other people in the world. So, in other words, I'm looking at it as a Canadian, and I realize that fellow Canadians are being polluted more than any other people in the world because of the climate changes. The climate change in the Arctic is particularly rapid. The impacts and effects of climate change challenge and threaten the very right 
of the Inuit to live as indigenous people. They face unpredictable weather, extreme erosion, and in some areas of the circumpolar regions during certain periods of the year, hunting has become more dangerous as the ice flows melt and fewer can continue the subsistence way of life. Our Inuit people are part of us as Canada, and that is why I'm always very interested when anyone says, well, we must move our armed forces to the north to prove that we have sovereignty. If you have sovereignty of a, in a country, it's because your people live there, and our Inuit live in the north, and therefore it is ours. End of the argument. They point the way for us in climate change, the Inuit do, and we in the south should be one with them. I think in everything else that we think about, we should understand what it is that divides us and what it is that puts us together with other people. What divides us, I believe, is not that we are all individuals and therefore must have our rights and make certain that others have theirs <clears throat> in as accommodating a way as possible. Rather, we start from another point of view, that basically we must concentrate on our connective tissue which creates communal efforts. We are fortunate in Canada because our native people, the First Nations and the Inuit, give us that solid base. They have never given it up. In the kind of society we live in today, which has endless means of distraction and methods of using up any economic resources that we may have spent all our time earning, it is, I think, healthy to think back to some of the real impulses of difference. <clears throat> I know that people talk about difference really as the way people look and act, whether they wear veils or turbans or black hats, but in fact all of those differences are things that we can accept in each other if we only analyze how we became separate. I don't believe that people are inherently tribal or that they only care about themselves. Evidence would prove that many people in moments of acute crisis do not behave out of individual selfishness, but out of a primal sense of their connection to other people. It is important to realize that we probably evolved as human beings in a way which meant that we had to look out for each other because we were only one little group evolving in a time of great threat and physical danger and that the initial instinct, I believe, is to reach out and help another human being. I came to this conclusion during the years I was Governor General because one of my duties was to give out all awards that came uh, from the Crown. And one of those important awards is the Bravery Awards and the most moving. And they were always given to Canadian citizens who had risked their lives in order to save other people. A typical medal for bravery would be given to a man who is driving down one of our large eight-lane highways and he sees a car or truck ahead of him that breaks into flame and swerves onto the shoulder. The man in the car following stops, pulls up behind and attempts by running to the car to take the driver out of the truck by breaking the window, trying to pull back the sunroof while flames are engulfing the vehicle. He yanks the person out, who by this time is not conscious, drags him to safety minutes before the whole vehicle blows up. I can tell you that in the, the two annual ceremonies for bravery, this scenario was enacted and enacted over and over again. And it always made me wonder why somebody would stop to help a total stranger, endangering their own lives, not knowing whether or not they would really succeed. One day I asked one of, the, one of the laureates what was in his mind when he was attempting to break the windows and get at the passengers to pull them out. And he said, well, I looked at that guy and I thought, that guy is me. That in fact is the total imagination of the other. That you are the other. That there is no separation between you and the other human beings that exist. When one remarks on the idea that strangers save each other, you have to delve quite deeply into the idea of what people actually really are. The Quran tells us 
as many of you know better than I, that we are created from a single soul. I believe that we are all part of one manifestation as human, pe <coughs> human beings. And in that moment when the threat happens, all the societal restraints and structures which we have grown up to accept as valid, looking after yourself first, not taking any risks, dissolve. The need for people to look after each other is something I believe is actually ingrained in human nature. I witness people who, often bewildered and terrified, performed acts of heroism which had nothing to do with people wanting to be heroes. Nine times out of ten, bravery medals were given to people who were saving complete strangers. Only one out of ten would be saving a member of their family from drowning or something like that. It also had nothing to do with whether the people being saved wanted to be saved. Frequently, it would be somebody driving along and seeing a woman jumping off a bridge, the Fraser River, those of you who know British Columbia know this, Fraser River in April, leaping into the river and saving the woman who had been attempting to commit suicide. It has to do with that fundamental primitive impulse to ensure that as many members of the human race can survive as possible. I firmly believe it is society and the structures that we have created that have made us the way we are in terms of being competitive, individual-driven people. There is too much evidence that our intuitive instincts, unfettered by structure or ideology, can become the basis for the good action. This use of intuition is one which I think we must work on if we're going to live together as human beings. I firmly believe that there are no roadmaps for creating the kind of society that we are now being asked to create. And we in Canada are in the forefront of this. Nobody else has ever done it before with exactly these elements. And what are the elements in Canada? Well, a population that comes from over a hundred different countries in the world, countless religions, and a diversity of political, religious, and social beliefs. The problem I have with people writing about difference is that they seem to feel that there is some way in which we can look at this and impose a pattern on it. What I think is exciting for Canada and challenging to all of us human beings is that there is no pattern for it and there is no simple recourse to custom or law. I mentioned that connectivity and community are the ways in which I see our country in development and I can't help thinking that it must be that we have instincts and intuition and do not always follow the official line of what our country says it is. I arrived in Canada as a refugee with my parents as a result of the Second World War after the taking of Hong Kong by the Japanese. And we were very fortunate by all kinds of flukes of chance to be brought on a Red Cross boat as refugees to Canada, where we knew virtually nobody. My father had done some business with some Canadians at some point, but we really didn't know anybody. We, had, we were allowed one suitcase apiece. We were given 12 hours notice to leave our house, and we arrived as a little family, my mother and my father, my brother who was seven and me who was three, in <coughs> Ottawa after two and a half months of journeying in a very, very circuitous route from Hong Kong to uh, Singapore to, um, to Vietnam, to um, South Africa, to Rio de Janeiro, to New York, and then Ottawa. And many of you in this room have lived that kind of refugee life. I know that, and I share it with you. And then we began again. And officially, what Canada was, was a white country which really wanted to stay that way, in which Chinese were not welcomed, and had very, until very recently had to pay a head tax in order to be in Canada, and in which the other large group of Orientals, the Japanese Canadians, uh, were going to be uprooted from the West Coast, their civil rights trampled on, their property confiscated and sold for profit, and forced against their will to move to the interior of British Columbia, where they lived in camps made of the, sh of the most flimsy materials for the first year, where they had no schools, where all of them basically were considered to be outcast. Now, I'm not saying there weren't certain Canadians at the time who said this was a bad thing, but most Canadians accepted this as okay. 
after all, we were at war with Japan. The fact that a lot of the Japanese Canadians that were brought to the center of British Columbia had been born in Canada or were second generation Japanese Canadians did not count. Yet our actual experience of living, my family anyway, in this tiny little frozen capital was very different from anything you could understand officially. We had some advantages as people coming to, this, to, the, to Canada. We spoke English because we were lucky enough to come from uh, a part of the British Empire, one of those other little pink spots on the globe. We were familiar with Tate and Lyle golden syrup and Cow and Gate condensed milk. <laughs> Touched a button there, eh? We were part of a system that was called imperial and had some sense of borrowed security from being part of the empire. I know Ismailis and many of you here have shared that secondhand familiarity. As we are all brought up to believe that structure is everything and that content must fit into a structure, we therefore believe that everybody innately knows that they are different. <clears throat> I don't think this is necessarily true for any kind of difference. I notice children, I have a grandchild who's, uh, when my, grand my eldest grandchild was three, she was in a daycare center, and they never noticed those children, whether children were black or whether they were oriental or anything. They would say, oh, she's wearing a pink dress. Or, there was never a notice. It had to be an adult that would point out to them that somebody had a darker skin. They do not notice those things until it is pointed out to them. I was very struck by that. I've come to this conclusion about difference very recently because I reject the idea that somehow we have gone against the natural grain of exclusive identities. Learning this early in my life has meant only that it came to the surface rather much later. As I say, my initial contact in Canada was this cold white place with a lot of snow, but full of good individual people. The Jewish pharmacist, the French Canadian relatives of a friend, of some, a friend that we had known in Hong Kong. And I think we make a mistake when we emphasize how much an abstract structure in a country will have an influence on its population. Rather than saying that the country was racist and the people weren't, I think one could say the people were not racist, but somehow the country got structured into certain racial dimen racialist dimensions out of ignorance and fear of the unknown. We were outsiders as a little Chinese family parachuted into Ottawa. But then so were the French Canadians in Lower Town compared to the English Canadians in Upper Town. So were the Catholics compared to the Protestants. Canada was a poor northern country. It always had been, populated by the flotsam and jetsam of the world. Everyone who came to Canada, virtually, is a loser. <laughs> Every single person came to Canada because they lost everything. People didn't come to Canada because they had a 400 hectare estate in Dorset. They did not. They would have stayed in Dorset. Why would they come to a, a climate like ours? Why would they live the way we have always lived, on the margins of things? Because they had no other place to go. We like, you know, I like that line in poetry by, by Robert Frost, which says, home is the place when you go there, they have to take you in. <laughs> and that's why Canada has been a home to people, always. We like to think that we have only recently become a diverse population. People will even say that to you. <clears throat> but I recently dug up an old photograph of Kent Street School in Ottawa when I was in grade four and we had United Nations Day. And it was the years immediately following the war and United Nations was so important and the schools went out of their way to celebrate it. There we are on the large wooden staircase of a 19th century school, grand old public schools we used to have, and uh, public in the sense of Canadian, not in Britain. And there we are in different kinds of national dress, which we somehow rigged together, because nobody really had anything like that. My friend Natalka in her Ukrainian blouse and dirndl skirt, a Russian Cossack with high boots, which were actually his shoes with cardboard bent around them up to the knees, <laughs> and me, a Chinese bride in a red silk embroidered top, my mother's dressing gown, uh, wearing my hair in braids over my ears like earphones. And of course, my friend Gail and her brother George in their kilts. The war had an impact on us because it was a Canadian who wrote the Declaration of Human Rights for uh, the United Nations, John Humphrey. And every year we would have this kind of, of uh, ceremony. Also, in the years after the war, 
we had an influx of what were called displaced persons. And the displaced persons were the flotsam and jetsam of Europe, who came because they had no other place to go. Canada was willing to take them in, and we la I laugh now when I think of it. If they would spend one year doing domestic service, nobody in Canada had servants. So it was a very peculiar category. Uh, people who had never had servants suddenly could get a servant or spend a year working on a farm. And I know somebody who was a Romanian princess who came with her mother, who was a grown-up Romanian princess, mine was a friend of mine at school, who spent a year at a Saskatchewan pig farm rather than be a domestic servant, because they really felt they couldn't be a domestic servant. They felt they had to go to the farm. When I re look back on it, I realize that what ordinary people were trying to say and do, the school principals, etc., was that they understood what had happened to us as a result of a war. And it seems to me an effort was being made to understand on a very basic level, to be part of a larger picture, to be part of a sense that we could, however timidly, contribute to a kind of internationalism which had not been ours before. It was the beginning of imagining what we could be, of imagining others who would take their place among us. Where did this strength come from? Right from the start of our country in 1848, the founders of responsible government said, we will be welcoming the children of other nations. We will be welcoming people from other worlds who will then call themselves Canadian. Uh, Wilfrid Laurier, our prime minister in 1905, when the West was being opened up and Alberta and Saskatchewan were declared provinces, said, we will welcome the last immigrant the way we welcomed the first. Everyone will be equal here. Let them not lose their past. Let them look to the future. Let their children be Canadians. This was always in our history. And so I think that where we have to realize that we're different is that we have a different kind of population. Having been the first immigrant to become Governor General of Canada, I realized that I wanted to start something that would help new Canadians be integrated into Canadian life more quickly. And therefore, as a legacy project, when I left Rideau Hall, I founded the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, which does special ceremonies. Uh, we've had a ceremony most recently, 10 days ago, at the Ismaili Centre in Burnaby. We have them in, in different uh, places, like the fronts of city halls, libraries, community centres. And we have a very interesting time where we bring new citizens who are going to become citizens that day, 50 of them. They come usually from 28 different countries. Nowadays, our population comes from everywhere. And we take, <clears throat> we take we take 1 percent of our population every year as immigrants. <clears throat> In other words, 285,000 about. Our target is 1%, which would be 31, um, 310,000, and we don't always make it. But I think that doing that, having this institute, and welcoming Canadians, new Canadians, and saying, we want you to integrate right away into Canadian life. We want you to go to art galleries. We give them a free pass to go to all art galleries and museums for a year for all their family. We're starting a program of getting to know the wilderness so that they can learn about what we consider to be a treasure as Canadians, the use of our wilderness and the camping and the cottaging that we can do. But one of the things that we know is that there is a subconscious part, uh, understanding on the part of Canadians that war had done something terrible to our world and we were accepting the consequences of that something terrible by accepting the people who no longer belonged where they had come from. We made the right steps after the Second World War because we were allowed to have these deep intuitive reactions as human beings to govern us. And that eventually overcame, and very quickly, by 1960 our immigration patterns all changed and we made it possible for Orientals to immigrate to Canada, for people who were not white to immigrate to Canada. It's that recent, and this change was that swift. And we overcame the structural indifference and the fear of the unknown that had guided our immigration policies in the past. We've always welcomed immigrants, and each time, because we wanted them to open up land, we welcomed Euro East European immigrants at the beginning of the 20th century. 
We welcomed people from the British Isles, even though one third of the immigrants in the British Isles in 1900 to 1910 had TB when they arrived. Uh, we, that would create a huge social problems, which we dealt with. You know, it was, everybody had TB. A lot of poor people had TB. The cities were, were overrun with TB. And we were, there were a lot of writings about, well, now we're going to, you know, first the Italians came. Well, if the Italians come, are they really white? Then Eastern Europeans, Slavs. Are Slavs really white people? And once that discussion had happened, it was over. And now, now today, we have the kind of immigration we have. In every language in the world, there are unflattering, to put it mildly, ways to categorize the stranger in our midst. It's when those characteristics become bound up with the sense that you must describe the other in a pejorative way, or else you might not be the superior person and might not have the materialistic advantage that problems start. I'm using a scientific model here by saying that we have all, as human beings, evolved at the same pace. This is the year of Darwin, after all. And we are all equal on the evolutionary scale. But all the great world religions have basically accepted this, that people are of the same family, and therefore what they look like only differentiates them, but does not make them unequal or unhuman. General Romeo Dallaire, who is a wonderful Canadian who was present and witnessed the slaughter in Rwanda and helplessly could, could not do anything because the United Nations would not help, and certainly the United States didn't help, put it very succinctly. Everyone is human, and there is no one who is more human than another. The Oxford philosopher C.D. Broad theorized that all human beings' minds and nervous systems are actually linked and are part of one large unit. He proposes that we at any time are capable of understanding and taking in everything that is happening in the entire world, in all of humanity. It's what Carl Jung talks about when he talks about the collective unconscious. But as we are only time-limited pieces of this great sanctioned intelligence, we individually organize our minds and our nervous systems so that we basically shut out everything that is not useful to each of us as a particular individual. The idea that we actually are part of everything and of the universe is not a matter then of belonging, but rather of being a part of the same thing. If we are all equal on the evolutionary ladder, then that part of our minds and nervous systems are the same, whether we're George W. Bush or a Bushman in the Kalahari. <laughs> if we understand that we can only have an idea of ourselves as a country, like Canada, by imagining what the other 31 million people are like, then why isn't it possible to imagine that we are all part of the same sanctioned intelligence. I believe if we were to make ourselves more aware of this with our particular circumstances and choices of welcoming the world and making the world at home with us, we could refine the idea of universal intelligence to our great benefit and the benefit of the world. Of course, there can be a misuse of difference and it can lead to the fragmentation in which people are increasingly less capable of forming a common purpose and carrying it out. It's then that people take refuge, and that is what it is, not a goal, but a last resort, in their ethnic minority, their group of fellow believers, the people they went to school with. The history of a human society shows how eagerly people will make groups to belong to. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as the meaning of the group is inclusion and not the group that is formed in order to exclude others. It is exceedingly dangerous for democracy if people become attached, more attached, to their small group. They will find it increasingly difficult to assemble around the common goals, which are the project of a free society. I think that the kind of responsible government which gave us our democracy and our exercising of it as Canadians over the last 150 years is a paradigm for what has happened in many of the Western industrialized countries. Where Canada is different is that we have virtually insisted 
on making our society one which accepts and wishes to integrate people from all over the world. When you go to an immigration office in a Canadian high commission or embassy in the world and you apply to go to Canada as an immigrant, you are chosen as a future citizen of Canada. You are not taken as somebody that can be let out and thrown out as soon as you're not useful to Canada. We vet people because we look at every single person thinking, when will they become a citizen? What will they have to offer us? What kind of gifts will they bring us? Their talents, their skills, what is it that we can ask of them that they will be able to take from us? And that is why Canadian citizenship, I believe, is the most open and the most interesting and the most intellectually challenging of any citizenship in the world. How do you make a country, though, out of such disparate elements? How can you have children wearing turbans and veils and headscarves? What do you do about a Christmas tree and about the fact that people observing Ramadan may be quite cross for 40 days because they can't eat between sunrise and sunset? That's why I'm always happy when Ramadan is in the, more towards the winter when there's only eight hours of light or 10 hours of light. <laughs> I feel sorry for them when it's in the summer and it seems to be almost 24 hours of it. A lot of these questions seem trivial and yet their triviality makes them important in the day-to-day -day life of all Canadians. First of all, we must conquer the ignorance we have of other people's customs. We must, and I think we are doing it in Canada very well, um, understand that in every year there are Christian festivals like Easter, there are Muslim ones like Eid al-Fitr, do we know what the purpose is of going to confessions in the Catholic Church or making the pilgrimage to Mecca in Islam? Can we balance out what Buddhist monks actually mean when they wear saffron robes and carry begging bowls without asking for food? Do we actually know what circumcision signifies? Without attempting to overcome ignorance and learning about others, we can only hide in refuges of bigotry and prejudice and ignorance. This is why we must persist in our creation of a country which has every possible difference in it. I know one doesn't say that very much. It's not fashionable, actually. People should all be like us, or we should all be similar. But we must encourage difference. You know, when Voltaire came to England in exile from France, and he saw the numerous religious sects that had grown up here, he observed, if there were only one religion in England, there would be danger of despotism. If there were only two, they would cut each other's throats. But there are 30, and they live in peace. We have seen this in our own history in Canada, only very recently, when there were only Catholics and Protestants. We had the Orange Order of the Protestants attempting to rip apart the fabric of the country and tear Catholicism out of it like a living sacrifice. And the ultra uh, commenting Catholics <coughs> demonize Protestants, circling themselves in narrow prejudice. As the country opened up, everyone, up to everyone over the next hundred years, these pitched forces declined completely in vitality. I can tell you in my childhood in the Ottawa Valley, which was a bastion of the Orange Order, July the 12th was a time that you did not go to the countryside to a small town because they would be having a King Billy parade. And I remember seeing the brindled horse, King Billy with the orange sash, in towns like Carp and Park, uh, Pakenham, all around the city of Ottawa where I grew up. That never happens now. It, it was about the triumph of the Protestants over the Catholics, which was carried on into Canada for so long, but it's completely gone. There's no question that the multiplication of difference has helped us to not rip each other's throats out, but on the other hand, we have to recognize that the introduction of difference has often meant that there is a period, not always concurrent, of misunderstanding, confusion, and adjustment. But if the long-term goal is to create a democratic project in which everyone will have a positive civic identity, then we simply have to be constructively patient while the rough places and edges get smoothed and eventually buffed. The way in which difference manifested culturally or expressed philosophically or religiously can help us 
is that we can learn about what others believe and try to understand even, even if we don't believe the same thing. But also that if a society is healthy, it will look at what other people believe and it will cause you to look at your own beliefs and see what foundations you have. To be able to observe others in their belief system and to question one's own beliefs is an inherently healthy thing. The worst thing is looking at other people's belief systems and assuming them to be bad because they're not your own. This is the very basis and foundation of the feeling of exclusion because it seeks to destroy connectedness and community. The concept of acceptance incorporates both understanding and tolerance. Acceptance in our country, I think, can be anything from wanting to know all about it and embracing it to I don't want to know anything about it as long as it doesn't hurt me. Most people fall somewhere in between and don't think about it one way or the other. We do not ever want to get into a position in a country where we force people to decide what they want one way or the other. The idea of coercion in a country is anathema and certainly in Canada it's just counter to everything our history and experience has taught us. So I'm very much for the promotion of what I have called passive acceptance. Now I know most people don't like to use the word passive because it somehow seems to mean impotence, weakness or indifference. I don't think it needs to imply these things and although it is the popular creed in our society to be active and make everything work I would like to plead for a little bit of room in a society that is as mixed as ours for passivity. This kind of passivity I don't see as exactly the opposite of action. The passivity I'm talking about is mixed with a kind of watchfulness and of course, always, latent curiosity. In passive acceptance, there must be built-in built -in curiosity. In the unitary states, like the European ones, and like the one in which we are tonight, where the nation is defined on racial, religious, cultural grounds, it's very hard to accept things that make visible difference. Look at how the French have gone into pretzel-like shapes in order, to, in order to be able to ban the hijab in public schools. In Canada, little girls play soccer with the hijab. They have then also been obliged in France, to, uh, wear cro to, be, uh, to make it impossible to wear crosses or stars of David. Seems like it's cutting off your nose uh, to spite your face. It seems that this kind of secularism can only define itself against religion and cannot take up a larger and more interesting ground where all cultures are accepted as equal in value and can be openly discussed and debated. It is this very nature of openness and debate which is so lacking in these tempests. In Canada, we are a secular state, and we have long accepted ourselves that way. By, but by the virtue of the passivity of our secularism, we have been saved from the kind of ludicrous assertion of our right to live in this negative space. The outward signs of difference are ones that we must learn to accept. In our country, of course, we have one thing really going for us. It's winter nine months of the year, and everybody has to wear a thick overcoat or an anorak and galoshes. So the visible sense of difference is often not as great in our country. <laughs> I don't think it's a trivial thing, but on the other hand, I think it does equalize it. And it's very important to remember that that's the way you're going to have to dress when you come to Canada. This is why I believe that when we accept to become a part of Canada as a citizen, we have to totally accept what it is, its climate, and also its history. We all bring identities with us from this hundred places that we come from, and it is what one scholar has called the impossible sum of our traditions. It's already going to be there reverberating in our memories, not only in our individual consciousness, but also in our group consciousness. And if we believe philosopher O.D. Broad that I quoted earlier, then we'll also be able to insulate ourselves from the larger intelligence to the intelligence of the group and then eventually to our own individual one. But all of this implies that each of us has an equality inherent in our very humanness. And as we become part of the imagined group, 
with which we associate ourselves when we become citizens of a country. We can say to ourselves we are part of it because we are consciously inserting ourselves into what looks like an almost chaotic structure. Each of these people, the 50 people taking place in a citizenship ceremony, such as the one I attended 10 days ago, <clears throat> come from 26 different countries, they become Canadians and I always emphasize they have to accept all of Canadian history as theirs. I tell them that it is not a buffet table, that citizenship is a fixed menu. You get the, the, the appetizer, the main course, the dessert and coffee with milk if you want. <laughs> But you do not have a buffet table in which you go past and you say, well, I think I'll have the turkey, but I won't have the shrimp. And I don't think I'll have the jellied salad, but I will have the coleslaw. It is not that. I never want to tell them this. I never want to hear from any of you. I am not interested in the, in the question of the residential schools, which so hurt our native people when we tried to assimilate them and destroy their language and culture. I'm not interested in that because it happened before 1976 when my family got here. I'm not interested in this or that. I'm not interested in the Japanese Canadians. You are being adopted into a family with its history. And this crazy old aunt who lives in the attic is your aunt. And you have to take it all. And that is the only basis on which you can have a citizenship for people who come from all sorts of countries. It gives everybody assurance. It makes it real to people what we've all lived through. One of the things that really makes me nervous, beyond the fact of the buffet, which I think I'm dealing with, is that people think love will iron out all the differences between us, among us. Maybe the tooth fairy would accept this along with a molar, but I don't think anybody else should. The evocation of emotion to resolve issues of civil society is not useful in a society of difference. To talk about love and invoke it as the only way for us to be united, misleads and deludes us about what gives us our strength as a unique society. The problem with a love scenario is that it doesn't leave room for differentiation and that the mind and heart will often go in different directions, just as it does personally. To just love people is not something which you can ask of a state, nor do many nations set out to be lovable. Many of them have made huge successes out of being unlikable and sometimes loathsome. Our society must be created through a different set of tensions which will include loving, compassion, but also includes analysis, acceptance, and curiosity. Going hand in hand with this is the idea that we should understand that we cannot create a civil society on the basis only of getting together with people we like and with whom we feel similar interests and goals. It is the easiest thing in the world to create little groups of people who are fond of each other. They're called friends. And friendship is a remarkable and totally necessary thing for the health of individuals. But the kind of love resolution that 1960s love can bring is not realistic because unless you are God, you cannot love that many people. And a country is also going to be made up of quite a lot of people. Our society has to be created through syncretic tensions that are inherent in our differences. Our true strength will come in making a good society, not only with those whom we like, admire, share values, but with, in creating the society with those whom we do not like. We must recognize that we have to create the society which is the relationship between human beings at its very basic level with people whose values are different from our own, whose inherent beliefs we do not like, and with whom we would not wish to share a park bench, a bus stop, or a sandwich. It is with these people as well as those whom we respect, love, emulate, that we have to create our society. It is totally unrealistic and a dead end to think you can make a society of only those people who are like yourself. The only way in which we can accept what we do not like is to understand that it is part of the greater consciousness, that it is part of the world to which we belong and in which we must play our part. 
Let us drop useless sentimentality and the shoddy illusion that warm feelings will cure all ills. We are fortunate in our society to have the differences, differences that point out exactly how we might not like each other and how in order to create a better place to be, we must learn to cope with these varieties. The society we build here didn't just happen. It has required vigilance and planning and constant effort, and it always will. But society is not just about fixing things. Society is about managing to live together so we can have the maximum amount of liberty within a structure that gives security so that we can exercise our responsibilities. It's like living in a condominium. You have the building, you have the condominium fees, and you have the fact that you're going to have to share that building with other people who are strangers. The delusion that we can love other people into a democratic state is pathetic at its best and dangerous at its worst. We all know that democracy is untidy and that if we want neatness, we should have dictatorships because they get things done on time and they can make people do things. If we believe that love will cure everything and all we need to do is learn how to love everybody, we will inevitably be polarized. We need to understand with our passive acceptance, our curiosity and our awakened knowledge of those who are not like us and will never be, that our society cannot be built simply on one element. Just because people aren't like you and they're not your friends, it doesn't mean you should tolerate them in the most limited sense of that word. Just because somebody is not your friend doesn't imply that they are an enemy. The ground in between is the one in which we have to operate as a decent society. And this is what we are doing when we try to create that society. This is what our challenge has been and will be in the future with the number of people that we accept from all over the world. And I say we accept. We are creating a larger circle to whom we grant everything that we have granted ourselves and in all knowledge of their differences from us. And this should be our goal. This should be our ideal. In closing, I really want to talk to you a bit about some other Aboriginal thoughts, and that is from our First Nations. George Erasmus, one of our greatest Aboriginal leaders, and he's still very young, says, the ideals of a good life are embedded in Aboriginal languages. This is why it's very important that we maintain these languages and that we give help for them to be maintained. There are 56 of them in Canada. Uh, there of which the major one, Cree, is not in danger, but there are about 46, some of which are only spoken by 30 people, 10 people, etc. All of that can be lost very quickly. The Anishinaabek seek the spiritual gift of Pinatswan, long life and well-being that enable a person to gain wisdom. The Cree of the Northern Prairies value Minachatwan, having good relations. The Iroquois Great Law sets out rules for maintaining peace among peoples, going beyond resolving conflict to actively caring for each other's welfare. Aboriginal peoples across Canada internationally speak of their relationship with the natural world, the responsibility of human beings to, remain, to retain balance in the natural order of nature, rituals in which we give something back in return for the gifts that we have received from Mother Earth reinforce that sense of responsibility. Our society includes Aboriginal peoples, and in Canada I'm very happy that we can use an Aboriginal way in, to make it more just. If we feel responsible towards each other, we'll be able to feel that difference of Aboriginal peoples will become an enriching factor in our lives and for our society. We all came as immigrants to Canada, every single one of us, French Canadians, English Canadians, everybody came as immigrants except the Aboriginal peoples. We did not come to an uninhabited land. There were two million native people living in Canada, it's estimated, in the 15th century. By the 19th century, our depredations of our society had reduced them to 150,000. They are now happily on the way back to a million two hundred thousand about. We had we came to this inhabited land where these people had known for millennia 
how to be nomads and roam over territories and share hunting. And they knew how to make the most of their resources and how to deal with each other in sharing hunting times and living through the winters. The difference between owning and sharing is the crux of what we must resolve. And it is at the heart of the darkness that we have let come between us and the Aboriginal people. And I think we are on our way to a good resolution with this, but it will take perhaps the next 10 years to do it if we really pay attention to it. When I talked about people we didn't like and whose values we did not espouse being accepted by us, I meant that we're going to have to talk to extremists and people at the far end of the spectrum whose prejudices are hateful. But I think that what we have to do is actually engage in these discussions, even if we're, we feel repu that's, they're repugnant. We have to do it because a dialogue is a dialogue, and what we've been engaged in up to now have been parallel monologues. It doesn't seem to me to have worked to tell people what they can't do and how much we don't respect them for what it is that they do do. At some point, we're going to have to engage in discussions with people who believe in violence, whose prejudices are not matched to our own admittedly prejudiced feelings. This is really going to be a test for us in Canada. The like-mindedness that most of us living in a peaceable, quiet country, which so far has managed to do a miracle of integration, I think is going to be challenged to its very roots. We're going to have to be non-traditional because we have to realize that by not talking to these people, not understanding, not having curiosity, not being able to engage, we'll breed larger and larger numbers of people who listen to extremists. Not talking to people reinforces prejudice and hatred. Not giving people equal access to all the customs and practices in their new countries will be a stumbling block to the progress of the country. We need to use the energy of difference to help fuel the strength of our political structures, our care for the environment, our passive acceptance of others. We have to use difference to find a new way, to find our way back to our single soul. Thank you.